Our friend, State Rep. John Cabello, sit right here in the studio with us now. When I said, hey, there's a handsome man in here, it, it, it was Dr. Alan Brown a little bit ago. John stood up immediately and thought that I, I, I was describing <laughs> oh, <wait>. him. <laughs> Fabulously handsome is how I, I you know, I, Alan's just your run-of-the-mill handsome guy. You, on the other hand, you know, you, you, you get more accolades than that. I appreciate it, but I think you need some uh, new glasses. <laughs> <laughs> or at least clean the ones I'm wearing. How you doing? Not bad. You know, I uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I apologize it's been so long uh, due to my schedule. Um, but uh, thanks again for having me. Oh, we're glad to have you in here. Glad to have you. You and I were talking off the air, and uh, with your police background, uh, this this was under my skin. It was bothering me. Uh, we, we we had another one of these stories that uh, came down. We can hit the, the exact location a little bit later on, but it, it's same old type of story. Two cops go in to have something to eat. They're on their break, and are turned away by somebody behind the counter. We don't serve cops. Um, that's unfortunate. Um, you know the the men and women of w men and women of law enforcement are uh, out there to uh, protect us from the evil that's there, and unfortunately, as we see in our community, uh, there's lots of it, uh, lots of crime, lots of violent crime, and uh, we have a very professional police force in this region, and I think it's time for the silent majority to stand up and be heard, and let them know that we support our law enforcement that we stand not be, not behind our law enforcement, but beside our law enforcement. And if we can't, the silent majority, stand up and do that, then we really have some issues. Yeah, because you, know, you, you, you often hear it described, that thin blue line that, that, that separates us from you know, anarchy and chaos and all that. Well, the, the thin blue line is under assault like never before. And as I said to you before, the same people who turn those cops away if five minutes after those cops walked out, somebody walked in with a with a weapon and demanded all the money and all that, who would they want in their back just as fast as they could get them? Absolutely. I mean, the, the police are tasked with a nearly impossible job, and we don't give them the tools of the first uh, budgets to be cut. Um, we, we've got to change that culture. We've got to sit there and remember that it's an insurance policy that we don't want to use, uh, but when we do have to use it, we want the best. Now... I'm not going to say about any of the incidents that are, have gone on around the country, um, but there are bad people in every profession. Um, I could name several governors on both sides of the aisle that have gone to prison. Yep. I can name several legislators that have gone to prison. Um, so we need to make sure and be mindful that we understand uh, that there are some uh, unfortunate individuals in every field, uh, but I think the police do an excellent job on weeding uh, them out. So. Again, it's time for the silent majority to stand up uh, and, and stand with law enforcement. State Rep. John Cabello with us, Riley and Scott on WROK. As long as we're on the police topic, I know you spent a lot of time in uh, negotiating the police reform bill, which is now law. Yes. Governor Router has signed into law. So what exactly does that, does that mean for police officers around the state? A lot of talk about cameras, and this doesn't mandate it, but it does set out some guidelines if departments wish to use the, the body cameras on police. What else is involved in this uh, police reform bill. There were 233 bills that wanted to change the way law enforcement did their uh, their assignment. Um, what we did was we whittled that down to close to 33. Um, law enforcement needs to be recognized for leading uh, the discussion on this. Um, we had met uh, several times to set out where we could be on the issue and where we couldn't be. And we actually uh, got pretty much everything uh, that we needed in that bill to, number one, protect our officers, and number two, to protect our citizens. Um, so it, it was very difficult, uh, long hours. The last day was 17 hours of negotiations. Um, law enforcement, again, it needs to uh, be recognized for leading uh, the changes that they felt uh, needed to be made. 233? Is that, what, is that what you said initially, that you, you, you boiled down to 33? Yeah. It was, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the issues were, you know, uh, you can't use a chokehold. Well, um, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, I want to make sure that our law enforcement has every tool available uh, if they get into a situation. If it's life-threatening, uh, I want them to be able to do anything that they can possibly do to make sure they go home at night. Right. And, uh, you know... So we, we had to negotiate on when they could use it. We had to negotiate on a lot of different things. Um, the bill is, is solid. Uh, not everybody likes it. There's a lot of things in the bill that I don't like. Uh, there's a lot of things that other folks don't like. There's other things that the ACLU doesn't like. 
um, which means it's probably a good bill because we all negotiated to the point where we thought we had to. Yeah, and when when not everybody or, or the majority of people all think that there's something in there I wanted that I didn't get, chances are it is probably fairly successful. Correct. The body cam bill, um, I, I uh, it, again, it's it's not mandatory. It does set uh, some uh, guidelines for uh, departments that want to get a grant for uh, the uh, cameras. Um, I wanted to see lawmakers have to wear cameras first. <laughs> It's not a bad idea. <laughs> you know, when you, when you ran down the litany of governors and other legislators who found themselves in the Gray Bar Hotel, you know, it, why, yeah. why, why not? It, you know, if you're, if you're in public service, maybe everybody ought to have one. I, I agree. Hey, Rep. John Cabello with us, Riley and Scott on WROK. The uh, budget stalemate continues in Springfield, though. The, the spending continues, too, via court orders and uh, some uh, uh, agreements to, to pay state employees as well that don't even need court orders and, and more spending uh, yesterday for... Uh, the, uh, the EI program, uh, we've we got to be past almost 90% of spending that's, over, that's still happening despite a budget. So what, what happens when eventually, eventually we think there'll be a budget agreement, we've already had this spending going out the door to the tune of like, what, $36 billion. Revenue is going to be $31.5, $32 billion, and we've lost seven months of the year to, to cut our way to, to get balanced. Is this, is, this, is this going to be a bigger problem going forward? I believe so, and that's why we wanted to not do this in piecemeal. Now, what we need to be mindful of is that we can, there, there's people that will disagree on the numbers, and that's fine. Um, 82% of Illinois' budget has been taken care of either through lawsuit or dissent decree. Um, why do we have 118 state representatives to deal with the rest of it? Why do we have half that amount of senators to deal with the half? The, the, the small portion of what's left... Um, we're not doing our jobs in Springfield. And it's unfortunate that we have uh, five people that have to agree on the uh, the agreement of the budget, and then they go down and, and make sure that all of their members are in line. One, one person decides that they don't want to be at the table uh, because they believe that one of the issues that uh, the governor wants, which is workman's compensation reform, um, is not part of the budget. Uh, but if you look at it, it really is part of the budget. Um, so he does not want to be at the table. So I'm not sure what is going to really happen here. Um, we keep hearing, well, maybe by January we'll have a budget. Well, in the meantime, we have uh, our most vulnerable citizens that are being used as a political pawn uh, in this political fight. Um, and, I, I, again, I'm not sure how this is all going to work out. Um, we do have um, some legislation that is uh, being researched right now so that we can always fund our critical services um, so that we don't have our most vulnerable being used as that political pawn and they are the first to be uh, uh, paid out so that they're okay um, of course I don't know if that bill would ever get passed <laughs> you, you had mentioned that part of the process is okay you get these people who agree and then you go back and you, you get your members to agree and all that well we saw we saw a little slippage that we haven't seen in, in quite a while and that is not managing to marshal all of those who are, are are supposed to follow your orders in Mike Madigan in an override attempt that was uh, historical um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what happened there um, but uh, you know well, it's, it can't be good when you have when Mike Madigan is calling uh, Scott Drury and and uh, Representative Duncan liars, and then uh, D Duncan and Drury are calling Mike Madigan a liar. A little in-house friction. Yeah, I, I would say there's a little bit more than friction. Um, it's going to be interesting, and um, again, it's historical. I, I'm, granted, I've only been there for three years, but I've never seen something like this. And talking to somebody that's been there for twenty years. They've never seen something like this. So, uh, if you want a show, sometimes you got to <laughs> tune in. <laughs> I take it from your tone that this probably won't be the last bit of show that we see. Then, yeah, you know, it, it's. I'm actually ashamed of being a state representative right now with what we've done in Springfield. Um, we bring, uh, we we have these um, uh, committees of the whole, and we have. Um, these vulnerable people that shouldn't be there in the first place uh, come in and they put them in a small little room and they keep them there for hours while they decide to do their business. And then when they bring them out to be part of the committee of the whole, half of the representatives already left and the other half aren't listening. 
And they make these folks travel to Springfield. I know there was a group from Rockford, so they drove three hours down to Springfield. I know that they were there at least for five hours in the Capitol. They got to be able to be on the floor for about a half hour. And then whether they stayed the night or they drove back, that's a long day for people that shouldn't be in that situation. Um, I think, really, it, it should be criminal that we're doing things of that nature. Um, we're not... We're not doing our jobs, and um, you know I have to take some of the credit for that. I'm not doing my job. I can't seem to get Madigan to the table. I can't seem to get these these guys to realize that there's people's lives in in jeopardy in this, and we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. State Rep. John Cabello, uh, bipartisan proposal this week. State Rep. Mark Batinick from Plainfield, and State Rep. Jack Franks. One of the uh, votes that did not go Mike Madigan's way on the AFSCME bill, uh, proposing a perhaps a, a two-year budget plan, take us through past the 2016 election year and at least get some longer-term stability in Springfield. I don't know if they have details on it. I think their main idea is just say, instead of just focusing on this year, let's at least do two years at once. Any thoughts on that? Um, I would want to see more information on it. Um, I don't see... Um we know what we're supposed to do. And every time there's a new governor, um, this, this game seems to be played. So it doesn't matter if it's a Republican governor or a Democrat uh, that's governor. There's a, there's a gentleman that wants to show that he holds the power. And he will fight to the bitter end to show you that he does. And a two-year budget isn't going to change that. Um, uh, what we need to do is, is uh, change the culture and by doing that, we have to elect new people. Speaking of electing new people, you're a guy who calls them like you see him. Rate the governor so far. How's he handling, uh, how's he handling this whole impasse uh, and the way he's standing his ground? He has to do what he's doing right now. Um, I, I would give him uh, uh, an A uh, because he's, he's fighting so many different fights on so many different levels uh, because everybody is testing him. We're nine months in. Um, you know, it, uh, I, I think some of the good things that he's done um, will eventually show uh, before the end of the year. You know, he's getting these contracts done with the unions um, for long periods of time. Um, there's one that uh, is still, you know, being uh, negotiated, uh, but he's showing good faith by saying, I'm not locking you out. We're going to keep trolling this contract, and we're, we're going to move forward, and we're going to move forward together. So um, I would give him an A. Um, can we... Can he improve? Obviously, yes. Everybody sure. can. Um, you know, I'm not perfect. I know I make several mistakes, and I'm not always right on every issue. So um, I would say for right now an A. You've got a tall task, not that you're uh, not up to it, but uh, effort to eventually retake the state house and at least get rid of the veto-proof majority in the next uh, 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 election cycle. How do you do it? Well, uh, we, we, we have to have everybody in our party uh, involved. Um, you know, I was uh, honored that uh, Leader Durkin uh, put me in charge of our uh, House Republican organization. And um, at, at that time, um, you know, I, I started to go to work right away. Uh, I, we secured uh, two national groups to come in to help, one being GOPAC, who will come in and train uh, our, our freshmen, uh, any member that wants it, along with our candidates. And I also, uh, we secured uh, the Republican State Leadership Committee. Uh, which is a national super PAC. What they do is uh, they help lots of candidates. They've helped me before. They put uh, $282,000 into an independent expenditure committee to help me get elected. Um, we've got them to uh, make Illinois a targeted state. So that should mean lots and lots of new um, revenue to, to some of the candidates. Um, I, I'm not going to go into specifics as to what the plan is because, you know, as a law enforcement officer, we love to have the element of surprise. Sure. And I want to make sure that we're not going to show our hand, and I want to make sure that we're going to go after the people that we believe that we can go after. Um, the plan that we've got, I believe within six years, uh, we should be within three seats of taking the majority. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot. That really doesn't. But in this state, the way they've, drew, they, they've uh, drawn the maps, it's a huge deal. Um, so with the right candidates... Uh, with the right farm team that we need to start getting in place all around the state. Uh, with, with the plan I think that we have, we can do this. 
uh, but we need everybody to be in the game. We need everybody on the team. Um, that means uh, from the grassroots to the top levels. And we have to do it uh, very quickly uh, because we just never know what's going to happen next election cycle. Well, and it, it must be, too, that when, when you mention those, those two packs that are involved, a, a lot of research, a lot of thoughts gone into it because people don't jump aboard unless they, uh, they obviously see an opportunity and a, a chance of success. Going into a state that's solidly blue and knowing you're just going to throw money down a rat hole that's going nowhere, you're not going to attract that kind of attention. Well, I think with the plan that, uh, again, that we've got, uh, the blueprint uh, can change. The blueprint uh, is, is not going to be a final blueprint. Um, it's, it's, uh, it just gives us a path of where we need to go. Um, again, I think with the, the, the partnerships that we're building, uh, they've never been there before. So um, this is our, uh, hopefully, our no, hopefully not, but our last best chance of trying to equal this out. Um, if we have more members in the House and the Senate, we can stop things uh, easier in committee. We can stop things before it actually gets to the floor. So, yes, there will always be, uh, you know, the majority will have more members, but it's a little bit more difficult when they have uh, members on their own party disagreeing. Um, so it's going to be much easier if we have some balance. Uh, 20 seconds. What's it like having the governor actually in Springfield? Um, it's... It's unusual. I mean, the, to, to actually have somebody that's working in Springfield, meeting with both sides of the aisle, trying to get everybody to come together. Granted, it's taken a little bit longer than everybody expected, but I think uh, what he's doing is, is an excellent job. And we mentioned, too, he saved the state a lot of money in transcript costs because he drops all those Gs. You know, <laughs> though that printing out all those Gs after a while has got to add up, don't you think? Fighting, running, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. John, always good to see you. Thanks for having me. East Thanks. State Rep. John Cavallo. It's uh, cloudy, 66 degrees, headed for the middle 80s. Right now it's 830 at WROK. Let's get to the news.